We now live in what has come to be known as the Anthropocene, an era of the planet's history in which the impact of humanity on the Earth is an incredibly significant factor. We have profoundly affected the air, water, soil, and even the weather on Earth, which should convince us that we have collectively immense creative power. But as we learned, that power is fractured into many pieces. From the millions of shareholders of corporations, most of whom do not really understand their investment and have no direct decision-making control over what they own, to the owners of these same organizations who are obligated to seek profits for those shareholders, even at the expense of the very communities in which they live. From the fractured international and national governments full of bureaucracies and overlapping and often contradictory missions, to the research universities strapped for funds that allow their scientists to be steered by corporate and governmental power, from farmers who feel trapped by a government that seems only to support one type of farming and who often sell their land to larger and larger enterprises that can make money from large-scale farming, not from the value of the food they grow, but from the processing, packaging, and marketing of food commodities kept afloat by government subsidies to consumers who are steered by advertising and social conformity to buy food in its least healthy but most palatable form because they've forgotten where food comes from and how it's supposed to taste. We've learned a little bit about food insecurity, which we normally think of as a problem of the developing world, but it's also a problem in developed countries like ours where because even in rural Midwest America, it's hard to find the knowledge or practice necessary to grow what's needed for a complete diet. A lot of people in rural America often have one choice about where to get their food, and it's someplace like Dollar General. And this even if they own or manage a farm or a meat processing facility. We've become acquainted with the benefits but also the drawbacks of a globalized food system. Among the benefits are lower prices, great convenience, and more variety. As somebody said recently to me, raspberries in the winter. The drawbacks include over-dependency on other countries for something we need to live. Our supply of food is more important even than our supply of oil, one could argue. And because of the way we farm, the two are also intricately tied together so, to, so that if the oil supply begins to decline, how will the world be fed? In both cases, we are incredibly interdependent. Yet, when we go into a grocery store, we don't necessarily feel like we are. We may feel very free because we have so many choices, and that is one of the greatest ironies of this whole system. That, and the irony, that in a country awash in processed food, in which much gets thrown away, a substantial section of the society cannot afford it and has to rely on the charity of others and government programs because the whole system at this point makes self-reliance and community cooperation extremely difficult. And this despite our political narrative in which we are free, proudly individualistic, and ever more prosperous. Our narrative doesn't match up with our reality. Where's liberty for a person in rural Kansas who can't find a farm job and can't live on the low wages of a meatpacking plant or the local dollar store and either has to get out somehow and never come back or accept dependency on government programs they themselves see as, sh as shameful dependency. There's a reason why drug addictions are rampant in rural areas. Well, it's hard to know where to go in such a confusing and often disparaging state of affairs and yet we are living in a time in which everything is, in a sense, up for grabs. The normal business as usual politics in the United States and Europe has been disrupted by people who feel they have been forgotten in this big global process and who often are persuaded that it's someone else's fault, taking on the idea that their particular nation, race, or sex has been victimized and the way back to health and vitality is by expelling or subjugating the victimizer. These are natural thoughts that always arise when people feel insecure and precarious. 
but they don't get at the heart of the problem. In fact, people divided along racial, ethnic, religious, gender, and ideological lines cannot take concerted action to really make their governments work for their needs and cannot really steer their corporate enterprises that they may in fact own if they're fortunate enough to have a retirement plan. Political leaders of the populist variety love to take advantage of people's anxiety. They are too vulnerable and dependent on others that they cannot control. However, such times also can open up the door to a type of popular leadership with new ideas that are creative and productive and that would never be seen as acceptable in more normal times. For this reason, it is particularly important to those who would lead in some way to learn about the many options and the many ideas, especially those outside the so-called Overton window. So what does leadership look like during times like this? I would think it would mean radically, it might mean radically changing the way you live. People will say, well, you have the luxury of doing that, but a lot of people don't. But that's precisely why that becomes a genuine leadership option. If those who are relatively wealthy decide that they don't need all their things, that they're, they're going to stop wasting so much, or they're going to grow more of their own food, or they're going to hunt and fish more and share it, or support a local farmer, they might become less of a burden on the backs of those with less and a source of employment and relative prosperity for a local businessman or woman, a farmer, a store owner, and their employees. They might also become a relatively less burden on the environment. And isn't that the responsibility of people who have more? They might even, through their actions, slowly change the habits and prospects of those around them. The idea that changing your life is somehow a luxury is a way to trivialize the only direct thing many people can do to change the world around them, and it's a fine way to stop people from doing something that might benefit other people in the long run. So I would urge you not to listen to those types of remarks. In whatever way you want to change your life, changing your life in a direction of doing the right thing, or at least trying to do so, is never a bad idea. Leadership might also look like taking some more direct political path. These days, the left-right dichotomy is pretty tired. It has not yielded solutions. The political parties are changing in unpredictable ways. Among other things, the current administration represents a rejection of the old political system and a desire by some people to shake everything up. During these times, it's easier to have true influence if you have ideas, because there is more confusion and there's more need for ideas. There is far more openness to ideas beyond the normal range, and you'll notice that in this course we did not look at the traditional Democratic Party view or the Republican Party view on these issues. Instead, we looked at ideas ranging from libertarian conservatism to socialism, from classical and agrarian conservatism to anarchism of various sorts, left and right wing accelerationism, and even eco-fascism. These ideas are not all equal on many levels. Some are more or less supported by science, for instance. Some are more or less morally acceptable or more or less likely to actually be implemented with some degree of success in humanity. But all of them get people thinking beyond the current worn out dichotomy that we have been living under for a very long time and which has not ultimately offered good enough solutions. New ideas and new leadership are needed, and that comes from entertaining many ideas that can stretch a person's mind and then allowing them to more easily formulate their own ideas. Only when you have your own ideas and your own convictions can you have influence, but new types of communication are necessary as well to have that influence. Academic journal articles are not going to have that influence. Books are not even going to have that influence, though they can be influential for those who absorb their ideas. We're living in an auditory and visual information world at the moment. The reason I had you do videos to express some of your ideas that you took away from this course is so that you could get used to the idea of communicating in this way if you aren't already. 
There is no way to overestimate the power of those who know how to use video and social media communication strategies in our political and social scene today. And I think that's been made abundantly clear of late. They have a combination of powerful new ideas and competency in the latest forms of communication. If you want to have influence in your world, you have to both have compelling ideas and the ability to communicate them. It seems to me that the most powerful way to communicate compelling ideas is to live them, first of all, and then be able to communicate them to others in a language that is readily accessible, does not follow well-worn patterns of partisan politics, and is intellectually and emotionally compelling. I hope you go out there and in your own way provide leadership because your generation cannot kick the can down the road like others have done. This is going to take sober reflection and intelligent analysis and concerted and courageous action.